Hey, everybody. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of Our Kids Play Hockey. We want to let you know that we have once again been honored with a nomination for the Hockey Podcast of the Year via the Sports Podcasting Awards. And all you need to do to help us is go to OurKidsPlayHockey.com and click on the Vote Now button. It asks you a couple questions. You're in and you're out, and you have voted for us for Hockey Podcast of the Year. I want to thank you all for being a wonderful, wonderful audience and helping us get to this stature of hockey podcasting because we've done it as a family, as the hockey friends and families around the world. Thanks so much and enjoy this episode of Our Kids Play Hockey. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Our Kids Play Hockey. Today, Mike and I are discussing how to retain your training. Now, what do we mean by that? We know in the off season or even in the season, you do a lot of showcases, you do a lot of clinics, you do some camps. Uh, everybody's trying to teach you something, but how does your child or how do you retain what it is that you learn? So it's not just the one-off thing you do for six weeks and you never see it again. We want to add those tools to our toolbox so you can continue to do that. So that's what today's episode is about. Uh, remember, if you love what we do here, make sure to like and subscribe or five-star review it wherever you listen. It really does help us out a lot. Uh, the podcast grows every week and we are blown away by that. And speaking of that, we're excited to announce we have a new partner this week in worldhockeyhub.com. We know next season probably isn't as far off as you'd like. So check out worldhockeyhub.com and explore their event finder, which houses more than 500 tournaments, camps, and showcases from around the world. Uh, we met the people over there. Uh, we we're really impressed with uh, their package and how they're putting things together and their commitment to the game. Uh, and the Hub is your number one resource for all things youth hockey related. Again, worldwide rankings, breaking news, top teams and prospects, and podcasts like Our Kids Play Hockey. So check it out. Again, worldhockeyhub.com. 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 Uh, yeah, that's about as advertising as I'll make that in the future. Don't worry, I won't do that again. Uh, and check them out. But until you do, enjoy this episode of Our Kids Play Hockey. Hello, hockey friends and families around the world, and welcome to another edition of Our Kids Play Hockey. I'm Leo Elias, and I'm joined today with Mike Benelli. Christy Cascio Burns is on assignment. I've always wanted to say that, Mike. Uh, and right. if you're watching the episode, you notice that I'm in my old studio today because my, my daughter is homesick today, guys. Uh, it happens to all of us. It even happens when you're doing live to recording, broadcasting. You may hear a scream. You may hear a dog. You may hear something. But the point is, we're here. And today's topic, for those of you who have been patiently waiting, is uh, retaining knowledge and skill after something happens, after a clinic, after a educational thing, and retaining that knowledge for the entire year. As Mike said, well, well Mike, I'll throw it to you again to explain this better. But the idea is that you go to a, a clinic, you get or you get a quick fix. How do you continue to keep that skill set in your repertoire beyond just the weekend you learn it? How do you make it part of your game? I've got a lot of thoughts on this. Mike's got a lot of thoughts on this. But Mike, a, qu a quick story, if you will, before we begin. You know, I remember when I was younger. Uh, this is one of my favorite quotes. Uh, it was Yamir Yager, I believe, said this. He said, you got to put a lot of tools in your toolbox. You know, you have your main tools, your hammer, your wrench, your screwdriver. In hockey, that you know, skating, passing, shooting, you get those main tools. But all those little tiny tools for certain situations, the ones you need to know how to use those, you got to get those, learn how to use them, and put them in your toolbox. And when you have more tools in your toolbox, you'll be able to fix and do more things. I always thought that was a great metaphor, but if you use a, a very specific tool once and you don't ever use it again, or 10 years goes by and you need to use it again, you're going to forget how to use it. You're going to find someone. It was a waste of money. You get to buy a new one. You know how it goes. But Mike, let me throw it to you because this was actually uh, an idea that you had. Um, and I love it because it's the two coaches today, two boys today. We, we miss you, Christy, but that's a topic for today. Mike, Mike, tell us what you want to talk about this one. Yeah, but I, th I think I think it all stems from now. This is clinic season, right? So I'm in these rinks right. all over the. I mean, right, basically right now, all over the tri-state area. And you go in every rink, and on a Saturday morning, there's a power skating class. There's a stick handling class. There's a, a checking and angling class. There's, there, you know, there's all, and which is great, by the way. I think these are these are really needed resources um, for any player. But I think the uh, what we need to be careful of as parents is saying, okay, well. If, if I put my son or daughter in this program and in this clinic, that's it. I did it. Like I put them in the program. They, right. they went to a, an angling clinic. They got it. They yeah. learned it. Now you and know how to power skate. Now you know how to power <laughs> skate. And I think right. so. And I, that's another right. pet peeve of mine that, you know, I don't know why we just don't teach proper skating Pro, yeah. from the you start. Do you that. Know, Mike Vanelli's proper skating clinic. 
You should just do proper, that. Just properly learn how to skate. Skating. Why the hell are we doing power skating? What is that yeah. anyway? I don't I don't know what it is anymore. <laughs> but all I do the know is word. that if we're if we're teaching our players how to skate properly, then we can maintain. Then they're going to be powerful skaters. But right. that's that's a whole nother episode. So so in this in this, so let's use let's use power skating as an example. Yeah. And so if I'm a, a, a 13 year old or 12 year old player and I go to a, a, a three day power skating clinic, great. I have the time, I have the money. The, the coaches are great. I mean, I'm, right. I, I actually, the one thing I will say is all these specialty clinics, usually the person teaching it is really good. I mean, you know, I'm not taking anything away from them. They're, they're I watch these guys, they can jump over, you know, three foot barriers, five right. foot barriers. They can spin, they can go on one knee, two knee, whatever. Edges look but like butter. Right. It, it's just, they look, they're just beautiful, beautiful skaters. Right. So, and I think that, so that's enamoring to me. I'm like, well, I want my son to look like that. Like, how do I do that? And I think so. Well, number one is, you know, we've, and we talked about this in other episodes, be careful of the, the churning episodes, right? When you walk out there and there's a power skating clinic and there's 40 kids out there and nobody really looks at your child. They might, right show them techniques but nobody can really grab your kid's knee and ankle and change it and say no no this is the angle you need to be in but again i think we've covered that now it's okay we're in it we're in a clinic with three kids doesn't matter right three days great clinic but you need to as a parent now now is when it has to be really concerning how do you maintain that that education that your child was given like how do you maintain the fact that okay in these three days on april 10th they did a clinic and then how does that transfer that knowledge helping you september through right. march of next year and that's where we got to be careful because i like i use example all the time if if they went to lee elias's clinic it was great the kids learned a lot they really developed and then they went and then that was three days and then they went to mike benelli and he's some psychopath and puts the kids on the goal line at the end of practice for 15 minutes at the end of every practice to condition them. Right. All of it's all of the muscle memory and everything that you learned in your clinic is be getting beaten out of them in my program and your clinic's three days. My program's 25 weeks. Right. I win that development good or bad. I, right. I, I win that muscle memory contest. And I think it's the same thing in shooting, passing, checking, We've got to find ways to tie in the learning and the development and the, and the long-term ability to now use that uh, throughout your career. Right. And there's a lot of ways. And like I said, we said it's tips and tricks today because we're going to give some actionable items to parents and kids here to do it. You know, um, we're going to talk about accountability here too, because a lot of parents and coaches, I think, think, Oh, that guy, he'll teach them. And the thing is, it's really on your kid to have the accountability to want to continue to maintain what they've learned just as much as it is on the coach's job to teach them. Right. Um, before we dive into that though, I do want to talk about muscle memory because I think sometimes there's misnomers about this. How many of you out there have kids that can go on the ice and do the Trevor Zegras, pick up the puck. There's nine years old. They can pick up the puck on their stick and flip it up and put it in the net. Um, I had three kids on my might be team that could do that this year. All right. Um, now a few things about that, I'm not against it, not, I'm not against it because it's fun. It's creative. I can see why kids want to learn it. I am against it though. If you can't properly stop on your left foot, right. In the sense of why are they learning how to do that and not learning how to do fundamental basic skill sets? Well, they put the muscle memory time into learning that. And that's the key, right? They practice that over and over and over again at home, which is fine. And after a while, it becomes easy. So that's what muscle memory is, right? If you want to learn how to do a skill well, and this is everything from shooting properly to having a great stride, you have to put in the 10,000 reps or whatever it is to make it happen. So muscle memory is something for parents. I want you to understand that if, you're, if you want your kid to really retain a skill, they've got to continue to practice it and put it into application because Mike, and as, as you know, uh, and I tell this to players all the way up to pro. It, you want to learn it to the point you don't have to think about it in a game. It just happens. All right. Trevor Zegers, when he does the Michigan play, I know he's probably clicking. Oh, I can do this here. He doesn't think about the skill set, though. He just does it. It comes very naturally to him to do that play, just like it comes naturally for players to do other things. Go ahead. Yeah, no, and that's key. And that's key, yeah. right? If I, if I, if I 
if I swing a golf club incorrectly right. for five weeks and I'm really good at swinging it poorly, then it's going to be really hard for me to break that habit. Right. It just, right. it's so if I, so if your kid is shooting in the driveway and they're sh- like, Oh my God, I love my kid. Look at him. He's shooting 500 pucks and they're all, you know, off his back foot and they're right. flipping them up in the air with the great. toe of the, the blade. The 500 yeah. shooting is great, but right. the muscle memory they're building is negative. So then, and then, cause I used to get, I, I mean, I made a living out of giving lessons to 14 year olds trying to retrain them. And it's so hard it because yeah. you can't be with them when you give them the homework to go home. Like that, that's why that, I like, that's why I like like long-term programming. I like long-term clinics. I like, like, I like clinics and programs where you go in and it's a nine, 10, 11 weeks that you do this, not three days on, on uh, you know, on, on right. Monday, Monday, Wednesday, Friday clinic, and it's over oh, again. I don't, we're not knocking I'm not them. Yeah. I'm not knocking those. anything. Yeah. I, yeah. I just think if you have the best, the best of the world, yeah. it's, yeah. Hey, can I get my whole team out right. here right. with the great power skating coach to teach them properly? And then can I bring my coach with me? That'd be something. And then say, yeah. this is the, this is what the muscle memory looks like. And I need you to cater your practices to replicate this. Right. So then every day they go on the ice, they're doing drills that replicate the proper way to skate. Not they don't keep unteaching it to yeah, teach it. Mike, wait a minute. It, Are you it. suggesting cooperative coaching between people of knowledgeable backgrounds that they share? It's that so cool. It's so cool now because yeah. you could text us. You could text information back to each other in video format, which is a right. really unbelievable advancement in our in our lives that you could actually collaborate skills coaches and hockey coaches together which i in my world of what i do that's i demand that like if you're if you're going to get a a private if you're going to have a private coach i think that's great if you want to get up go with your private coach but if your private coach is not consulting with me right and understanding what i need and what i see because i see them more than you then there's there's always going to be a disconnect and you know honestly there's going to be a problem because the, the private coach is paid to tell you how great you are. You look good. You can stick handle. You should be on the first line. Wow. You, you have the best edge control I've ever seen. And then the, the team coach is going, why didn't this kid ever pass the puck? He just goes around a deviator and he looks good in a cone, but then there's no, they don't do anything. Yeah. And I think right. that's where the disconnect is. And that's where we all have to, you know, converse together. Well, look, there's a lot of ego <clears throat> in why yeah. people do these things. And, Look, let's be honest, parents, you know this, and, and coaches too, Everyone, everyone's looking for a little bit of an advantage, or they think they're looking for an advantage. And there are some situations, you know, if you're on a tough team, I actually understand that. So the, it, you got to have your goals really, really clear about the development of your child, right? So whether it's a private lesson or a skill camp or anything, this is going to go back to what I said, there's some accountability here on you and your kid. Uh, to make sure that you're retaining it to your, that you're applying it. Like you shouldn't be afraid to go tell your head coach that you're getting private lessons and you're doing this clinic and adversely people running these clinics. And again, like some of these are cash grabs. We know that, but if I was a coach running a private clinic, I'd want to speak to this kid's coach. I'd want to know what the coach wants them to work on in in certain situations. Obviously there's going to be parents who think the coach doesn't know what they're talking about. Right. But, but but this is, this is your great if you if, and this is great. If you think that's your coach, Right. This is a great way to subtly add in that. Wow, I could now I could coach my coach, right? By right. having them communicate with this great power. Like, this is really true in goaltending. Like goaltenders, I, I don't understand how you could be a goaltending parent with the mixed messages of the private goalie coach, the private goalie clinic, the goalie right. guy that says he's a goalie coach at your practices, and there's three different people, and nobody's communicating with each other. Right. And to me, it's like, oh no, we have what's best interest in your kid. No, you don't because you're, 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 my kid is a, is a scrambled mess because right. they don't know, should I be in the VH? Should I stand up? Should I use my blocker? Should I use the angle? Should I lay in my net? There's so many different aspects of how we're teaching, but I think this is, the, you know, think about that. That's a great opportunity for you to say, Hey, listen, I got right. this great shooting coach, coach. And I, um, uh, you know, Michael's seeing him like twice a week right now. I mean, he looks like he's, he, he seems to be enjoying it. You know, this would be a great, maybe we could have him in for a day right. and then get that, get that shooting coach to teach your coach how to coach. Well, we talk about delegating responsibilities as a coaching staff. We've had episodes on that, you know, as a coach, 
you know, if I got a kid who needs to work on a shot and he wants to get a private coach to me, that's a benefit. Like, okay. Not that I don't have to do it, but it's, yeah. he's putting in the extra work. Let me talk with this guy, see what they're working on. I can apply that into the drills. But again, we're talking about an egoless environment here. The other thing too is Mike, like it's tough enough to get coaches in the same age group to talk to each other, which I think is insane. I remember this year I said that, like, why are all the Mike coaches not meeting once a month to go over what we're doing? Why is there no meeting between the Mike and the squirt coach about the transition to squirt? It's like, it's like a baptism by fire and it really doesn't need to be that way. In fact, I had calls with a coach that I know did squirt this year towards the end of the season, trying to learn, Hey, what, what are the things you need me to kind of get these kids to understand fundamentally, to understand the full rank and offsides. And like, what can I imply into my, 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 or, excuse me, apply to my practices. He was all ears about that. It, it was a great conversation, but then again, like, you know, I'm, I'm coming to this, like, well, I don't coach this level and I want to know, and uh, more people need to do that. Now let, let's return this back to the kids though. Cause I, I do want to get to some tips and tricks and things that, that um, at least I used to do to retain because again, I had a unique hockey jersey. I started really late. So I didn't, I, I didn't have the ability to kind of forget anything. If you know what I'm trying to say. Um, right. One of the things, the first thing, one of the most simple things, and I remember my father made me do this and I still do this to this day is I have a notebook and I write down every drill I do. I write down things that I learn as a coach. I write down notes from every game. All right. Didn't do it as in might so much, right. I did it at the start of the season. Once I felt like I had a grip, I, I put it down, but, Kids, if you're getting private lessons, even practices, do you go home, parents, do your kids go home and write the drills they did that day in a notebook? Very simple. It's very easy to do. They might fight you a little bit. I wanted to do it, right? But it's a great way to write down the skills. And I'll tell you what, when I was a teenager, I would go back to that notebook to look for drills when I felt like I needed to work on something or even to kind of connect the, the, the brain waves to the body of, oh, I do remember doing that. Right. So that's the first step is it's simple, but the accountability was on me to go to a private lesson, come home, write the drills out and then find ways to work on them. Keeping in mind, again, um, the best private lessons coach I had, we didn't do 10 drills in a private lesson. We did three and we did them well. We did them over and over and over again. Right. Until I got the muscle memory built up and then I had to continue to do them at practice. There, Mike, there are still in adult league, in adult league, there are still warm up things that I do from drills I learned as a kid that I just, it just kind of, they, they, their muscle memory drills that kind of activate skill sets in my brain. At least that's the best way I can describe them. Right. Um, everything from the iron cross to like some puck handling movement to, to, to even stride work, but and this is in three to five minutes, but these are things I've learned over, over 30 years. Right. Maybe yeah, not. You, that and you, you, you just go yeah. into it like saying, okay, this is a comfort level for me. This feels good for me. This is how I kind of, you know, get myself into, Right. Uh, game ready mode. And, and there's nothing wrong with that. That's where that, that, that matter of fact, that that repetitive nature, that mechanical process is actually probably really soothing for your brain. It totally. Ready, right. It just, totally. It just, I'm not so ready to play. I don't need to do rethink this. anything. I'm just I'm just yeah. it's like coaches yeah. that add like new warm up drills, like two seconds before you go on. Yeah, the why? Ice. Why are you doing it that? just That's... causes all kinds of like, you know, stress. Right. Well, it, look, look, let's go back to younger. Again, we always split these uh, age groups up. We always say this is kind of like you know, six years old to, to 12, 12 to 15 is kind of that honeypot time period. And 15 to 18 is, is a little different. But even in mites, your kids should be doing a basic passing drill and then hitting the goalie in the pads. I, I, would, get, I would get upset with my kids if they were doing Michigan pickup puck things in warmups um, because it's not what they need to be working on in my Well, opinion. they see that, right? If you, you go know, to a Devils game, if you go to a pre, a, a, you know, if you go, if you're, if you're fortunate enough to go to a professional hockey game and get to go and see the warm up before the games, right? The right. 20 minute warm up. They're do, but they have 20 minutes. They have 20 minutes. <laughs> you but here's have the three. thing. They also do a ton of basic work too. I have right, seen Crosby. See I've seen McDavid yeah. before games, just puck handling, just puck handling. That's it. They don't, they're not doing anything crazy. I've also seen guys do crazy things too. But my, my point is this, is that, again, I got to say this, I'm not against creativity, but I, I, I'm thinking, you, you got to think when, when you're warming up, you got to pass, make a good pass, make a, catch a good pass. And you said it's very soothing to me uh, before a game. And, and like, like you said too, don't change your warm up. Your warm up should be familiar. Your warm up should be, you know, things that activate muscles, that activate your brain. Like when I'm running practices, Mike, I like to, after just kind of a, a basic skating warm up, I like to, you know, do some flow. Um, I like to do brain exercises, things where I know they have to think before they go. 
And I'll tell you what, if I don't do that, it kind of, it's obvious. It's obvious during the practice. If I don't wake their brains up that, you know, they start fumbling around and stuff. No, you so, see it. I mean, if you listen, yeah. if you have a kid that jumps in the locker room and, and, and it's the same, listen. And so I, I, I guess like even staying on topic of what we're talking about with the private lessons and that piece, like to me, that's almost a more important aspect of how right. do you learn? Like, if you're going to go do a power skating class, go through your same routine, go to the rink, get warmed up, do your run, do your dynamic stretch, like do the same routine. Right. Because, because that's where you want to have, you want to be ready mentally right. and physically. Cause if you're just going, listen, if your kid's going out and doing the motions and he's, he's the fifth person in a line of six of, of six lines. And he's the fifth person in one of the lines and you see him just, go down the ice and do these drills without being like any kind of actionable items, then you really got to look at yourself in the mirror and say, well, why are we here? Right. Like if you, if, cause if you want to do that, just go to public skate, you know, spend your eight bucks and, and skate around in the rain. But, yeah. but if you, if you want to retain information, then, you know, and I think going back to your point, Lee, and I, and I, this is one of the things that, you know, not whether they're a, a child's working with me personally or I'm advising them to work with one of the other skills coaches. My, my big red flag with skill coaches is don't ever just jump on the ice week to week to week to week to week without any kind of a plan. If that's your skills coach, that they just wing it when you get there, yeah, that's and they say, hey, what do you want to work on today? And they want to charge $120 to do that. I would run so fast from those people <laughs> that you know, you, their head would spin because there's no value in that. The yeah. value is what you're saying. Here's my three things. Oh, and I talked to my head coach. This is what he thinks the three things right. are. That's Here's so what valuable. I think the three things are. And one of the reasons I'm not playing is because this guy keeps saying I can't catch a puck on my backhand. So I'd really like to learn to catch a puck on my backhand. Right. Okay. I'm a, I played Division One college hockey, and I played pro in, for five years, and I can do that. I can teach that. I'll give you a great analogy for this, Mike. It's funny. T talking about a different world. You know I do professional speaking and public speaker. One of the lessons I learned early on, people used to ask me, what do you speak about? And my, my, when I was younger, my answer was, I can speak about anything. I, I, you know, I love this. I love that. Uh, that's not what they wanted to hear. They wanted me to say specifically what I speak about. When I started doing that, I got a ton more work. What do you speak well, about? Well, it sounds like, great, right? I can talk yeah. about anything. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, that's it great. <laughs> yeah, but you know, they, they, they don't want that. They don't need you to tell them. You're asking them to figure it out. When I started saying, I, I talk about the power of trust and how that applies to teamwork and why every team needs to understand what that word means. Whoa. Well, I need that. Right. You, you know, that's changing. Oh, that's the, and that's the hockey. thing. That's the yeah. same thing. Like I say that same way, right? If I, if Mike Benelli hockey solutions is, is, has a menu of items that I work with, with, with right. organizations, I can't just say, well, here are the 75 things that I do. <laughs> right. for your you can't do that at a restaurant. I can say, yeah, right. Yes. I said, here is my top three things that I can do for your organization. Right. Well, you didn't do that for the other organization. Well, I didn't need to. Well, I know that organization. It, like, it's so like a I Jersey need, diner, right? When you go to a diner, you know exactly yeah, what, what you what want or you don't know pages, what you want. Seven pages yeah. Of, of, yeah. of laminated yeah. uh, and menus. And you're probably like, going there, like I said, because you either know exactly what you want or you don't know what you want and you need a smorgasbord of things, right? But when you want what you want, you don't go to a diner. You go to an Italian restaurant because you know you want spaghetti there. You ever, you ever ask the waitresses in, in one of those diners, like, what do you suggest? They yeah. look at you like, are you crazy? Yeah. yeah. Eggs. Item number Eggs 670, I like. I like right. that one. Right. Well, a lot of people order the, the Reuben. <laughs> so, but that's my point. But that's yeah. when you go to a skills coach right. and, they, and, they, and the skills coach looks at you and says, hey, what do you want to work on? You're like, I, I want to work on shooting. Okay, great. great. <laughs> what, what, is, yeah. what is it about your shot that you don't right. like? Now, conversely, if I'm a skills coach, I'm like, okay, you know what? And you don't know what you want. I don't know what you want. So by, I'm just letting you know that this right. first 40 minute session is going to be an evaluation totally. of maybe a yeah. bunch of different stuff. Yeah, let, and let, I'm going to, you're going to use my expertise to if, if, listen, if a coach can't watch you for 50 minutes and give you a paragraph on right. what they think your pros and cons are, then they're probably really not a, a good coach. No, I, I'll <laughs> tell you this. And I'll speak from my own experience. Cause I, I, I went to private lessons a lot in my youth um, and I, I can tell you right now, I get three gentlemen sticking out in my head right now had profound impacts, but they had a plan when I showed up. And then, you know what? I remember them, Mike, this is so important. They sat with, with me for 30 minutes before the practice. They sat with yeah. me for 30 minutes, sometimes more after the practice, just to kind of talk and review and understand what it is I need to work on. And it's funny because I remember specific drills that I use now. You, you mentioned it before about catching a puck on the backhand. 
And I remember I bought that, brought that up to a coach and he had a drill that in two sessions, I mean, I was good at it. All yeah. right. And, and then once the muscle memory came in, it was not even, uh, I mean, I don't have to think about it anymore. So you need to well, get your money's worth out of those people. Yeah. But Go think ahead. about that. That's my point is like, okay, now you did that. Your backhand was great. Now imagine you don't see that person again. And then you go into practice and your coach never right. has drills for the that incorporate pass. using backhands. Right. So are you going to get good? I mean, uh, Matt Herr was one of the USA hockey regional managers. He works for the NHL. Now he played at uh, Michigan, Michigan. I hope, I hope that's right. But he played, he was a, a division <laughs> one baseball college hockey player, in America, played college hockey in the U S <laughs> so uh, for red Berenson. So is that Mar Michigan? Right. So he, so he was a division one baseball player and a division one hockey player. After he had gotten drafted, I think the story is, is like a senior year, he stopped playing baseball. And he probably could have played pro baseball. Right. But one of the things he was great at in his college games was tipping pucks in front of the right. net. Right. And he right. Stopped, when he stopped hitting, though. That went away. It went away. And, right. and, it, and, it, it, and this is a, a, this is a, a, a Division One professional athlete right. that because he didn't, you know, like in this, in our world right now, Chris Kreider is like known as like, he's got the magic stick because his stick is always active in areas of the ice. Right. And like, well, does he just get that? No, he, he probably spends like 40 hours a week right. working on tipping. I, I guarantee you every practice he's doing that every warm up he's doing that. Yeah. Right. I remember another thing too, is you got to remember with NHL and, and, and I, I think it's a fair comparison, but I, I always remember my dad saying this to me too, you know, NHL guys, on the ice every day working on stuff every day your kid doesn't get to do that right so you got to be creative in the ways you do that and by the way with that said there's never been as many training aids and opportunities to work on stuff as ever before the stuff that exists today mike and i did not have when we were growing up just didn't have i, I certainly didn't have a green biscuit i'll tell you that now <laughs> I, I was I, right. was I was i was slapping around you know the puck that looked like it'd been through world war right. four it was a half I mean, just, ball. It, <laughs> it just yeah just it's just it's just a right. rounded piece of you had you, know, you had a stick and, and something to hit but but go on, go, but okay, you're, right, you're absolutely right though that's yeah. that's that you can create that now again you can your kid can your player should be if that's who your players is if they are if they're truly about getting better yeah and you'll see your player in the driveway right doing so the we should things rewind that back coach asked them to do we should rewind back here too and yeah. always mention this look if it, i remember i was listening to a, a, a an npr radio thing with wayne gretzky one time and a woman called in and said listen my kid doesn't like to practice doesn't want to practice how how can we make him practice that was the question and gretzky who's a pretty good example of someone you should probably listen to says i can't make your kid practice kids got to want to practice Right. So if you have a kid at home that doesn't want to practice, they're young, they, they want to do other things. First things first, that's OK. It's really tough as a parent. Even I have this problem sometimes. It's really tough to sit back and go, oh, I'm paying all this money. They don't want to work on it at home. If you take the love of the game away from them, they're not going to do it anyway. Kids will be kids. Now, with that said, now I'll use my own son as an example. Uh, I'm proud of my son. Um, halfway through the season, he was having problems and he was starting to go the wrong way. <clears throat> he says, you know, I'm, I'm not where I want to be with this. And I said to him, if you want to get better, you have to put in the time. And if I said, if you're serious about it, you got to put in the time. If you're not serious about it, that's okay too. But, but don't act like you're serious about it. He went downstairs, he shot, he, he learned, he got better. Okay. It was a cool moment. Had he not done that, that's okay with me too. All right in the sense of if he actually doesn't care, right? He's passionate about other things. So I wanna say that again, when you get older, this changes. My kid's a mite, all right? It's about having fun right now. When you get older, I, I, I've told this story in the podcast before. I, my father told me one time when I was 15 years old, uh, I used to like for him to tell me to practice. And he said to me one day, if you wanna do this, you will do it without me asking. And I never asked him again. I went out there every single day because I wanted to do it. Right, Mike, I think that's really important. If your kid doesn't want to do it, again, it, it, there's a little bit of a balance here. It's not, you know, it, again, there's a difference between being lazy, not wanting to do it, and like just not being passionate about it. There's, there's two different things there. If your kid's lazy, just wants to sit around on his phone, now get, get up and get outside. You do something else. But, but, you know, if your kid is just not into it, that's okay. I, I don't know how to stress that enough. Yeah, I got that. I got that the other day. I got the, well, dad, isn't this supposed to be fun? no <laughs> no fun no he is zero fun sir you can't if you, yeah. you know I, I i you know i often get the little kids especially i do this uh, little rookie league and 
you know, the six year old and seven year olds. And I'll, I'll, it's great now without masks on because you can really get to them and right. see their emotions. Right. And I'm like, Hey, listen, if you're smiling out here, I gotta, you gotta go off the ice because this is serious business and they'll right. smile and they'll relax and they'll, you know, they'll be That's laughing. Should be. And yeah. I think, you know, and again, but, I, but then we, but then our, but then our gear switch, like, and, and we, and, and we just like, you must like, and it is, it's, it is, it is really, really like hard as a parent to watch another kid steal a puck from your kid or, right. or be a natural at something or, you know, and then you saying, well, see what that kid's doing. Yeah. And, and you, yeah, you and it really is, it's hard. <laughs> Listen, it's, it's difficult because it's the same thing. You know, if you go to school and you're like, and you're lo looking up and down the hall and you're seeing all the art projects and you're like, that's my kid's art project. Oh my God. Like I said, I said, what are you yeah. doing? Where's your I jeans? Picasso. Yeah. You know, oh my God. What did I do here? So this kid has no talent, but it is hard. It, it, but it's so it's, it, you know, but that's parenting. Right. But I think when yeah. it comes to, you know, uh, lessons and learning, like that's the key. If you don't, if, if I don't care if you're six or 60, if you don't want to retain, listen, I've been trying to learn Norwegian for 10 years. You know, I go, right. I go, I go, we go, we go to Norway every year. And I'm like, I just don't have it in me. Like I just, I just, there's nothing that does There's no pain point for right. me because I can like, ah, if I really don't learn it, I'm okay. I, I can still get by, you know? So I think it's like, it's the same thing, right? There has to be, there has to be a desire from the participant right. to be passionate about well, learning. And, and, I and think as a that's parent and a coach, you want to help create that desire. I think that's a big Well, yeah. And you can, yeah. that's your job yeah. as, a, as an adult is to say, well, you know what? Right. I can probably put this person in a situation where they'll find it right right and if they that's don't exactly it and yeah. if they don't they don't but uh, and you know I I, I I i i laugh all the time with my kids or the parents when i'm speaking to them about skill development i go listen we're going to give them this these tools we're going to put them in this situation they're going to learn it or they're not right if they don't learn it there's the, there's nothing we can do about that there's, you know, there, there, it's just like it's just this. not in the cards here's a thought for you right all our kids play games at least most of them do. It's tough to get them off. They love it. No, just one more minute, just 10 more minutes, right? They love it. They love it. And here's the truth. They're probably pretty good at it. Okay. And what do we say? That's a waste of time. You know, you should oh, be playing every day hockey. <laughs> yeah. Here's the thing though. They're good at it. They do it. They practice it. So what's the difference between that and hockey? And the difference probably is, is we're hands off with the video games and tell them they can't do it to a point right? They're, they're having fun. All right. You got to make hockey and sports and everything else as fun as you can. You know, look, we have a saying in, in when we coach coaches, it's never be a kid's last coach. That's always a goal of mine. Do not be the last coach this kid has because then it's, it's your fault. All right. Most, most likely. Right. Yeah, are, that's one of my cases. present. That's one of my presentations. And yeah. in, in, uh, when I do the coaching education program is if you really want your son or daughter to get off the video game, Right. sit with them and play the video game That's and tell right. them no totally wrong right. door wrong door don't use that button <laughs> are you kidding me what yeah, did you come down here for 15 hours and you don't even know how yeah. to find the secret passage like right. like to me great, you want to belittle point. you want them to quit belittle them tell them how <laughs> stupid they yeah. are how yeah. horrible they are and maybe they'll run and i do that i'm like will we run outside and play with me right if, if i do that we're using this but as a the, metaphor obviously right yeah right but the, well you know? no, I, I do it i just what i actually do yeah. so but i i think i no, but i think i think it's like one of those things where we're in a different world they have they have control of their world right and we try to control right the world like so i think that what are you going to fall to you're going to fall to the world where no everybody's like oh my god he's going to leave me alone down here right and i'm just going to play all right. that's, day that's every kid and it was us too it was us when we were that age with other things like and, and i think what happened is a lot of times at our age it might have been game, sports <laughs> that might have been yeah, a, if somebody listen you know, if my father would have right. made me go out and shoot pucks i'd be like are you kidding me right like you just did not i talked to i talked to division one and pro, ex pro players literally every day right about their kids and about their desire to see their kids do things they did I'm like, well, have did your dad or mom ever demand that you get outside and shoot? Never. Then maybe we should think about that. Right. Maybe that's a maybe that's a message. It's maybe a big that's message. You know, that, they that's why you became you. They love to but, do it. Right. So so going back to like our our point right of the clinics and the camps and the retention is then seek out. You don't have to seek out the best instructor. You've got to seek out the one that produces the most passion for your kid totally true so do, do you need an yeah. x 
you know, the, 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 do you need the, the Rangers skills coach to work with your six-year-old? No, you need the guy or girl who your son or daughter is yeah, you know, eyeing to go see. Mike, you're making a great point now. The three trainers that I talked about all made me love the game more. One of them was a Division One college player. And, and he, I think he saw a lot of himself in me and he let me know that like, and, and he was very encouraging. Like, you know, you're not there yet, but you could do this. You're putting the work in, you can do this. One of them was a former NHL player and he was just a, a, the happiest guy in the world being on the ice. Uh, and yeah. it was infectious. And it, it's funny. You mentioned that one of the guys I trained with was a Rangers trainer. Um, now I was in college with him uh, and he killed me, but he made it fun. Like, and he let, you know, like you're putting in the work these pros put in right now. And, 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 I remember he used to make me take a rock, a gigantic boulder rock, and throw it down a football field, and I hated it. And he was he, the, just the messages he would give were so funny and good that you, you couldn't help but love the grind on that. But like you said, they, they fit my personality. They worked well. I, I can tell you right now that they were not just doing it for the money because I don't I don't think they were getting paid that much. In fact, I remember one of them one time we, I forgot my check and he just like it's all right, it's free today. Like he just did it because he loved to do it. So again, getting back to the point, whether it's a private lesson or a clinic, I always talk about interviews and stuff like that. Don't be a jerk, but you have the right to ask questions of what is my kid going to learn here? Or my kid needs to work on this skill. Is that something you can help my kid with? Uh, or ask the kid to sit down with the coach. What do you want to work on? What parts? Again, a kid, a kid might say shooting. If you're a trainer, you should be like, well, what type of shooting? How do you feel your wrist shot is? Wrist shot, uh, snapshot, slap shot, backhand shot. Uh, toe drag shot like like which one of those are you great at which one of those are you bad at or do an evaluation as you said but like like is it anytime you're trying to work on something you want to be worth your salt with this stuff and then retaining it because we got to keep talking about that one thing i said is get a notebook i mean i wrote everything down um now i'm a writer by nature but like i wrote every drill down and i would refer to them and i'd look at them every night that was a way to get i said like kind of the mental wiring to remember the drill and to do them. <clears throat> the second thing I want parents and, 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 and if players, if you're listening, coaches, if you're doing this right, you should not, should not have to think about doing it so much in a game. It will happen because you've been practicing it so much. There are so many examples of me coaching where I can tell you I've worked with a guy or a girl a million times on something, I'm exaggerating, and then it happens in a game, they don't even realize they did it right? That's how you build up that muscle memory. So after the clinic ends, you need to find the ways, A, to either be able to do this on the ice that might be during warmups. Most coaches give you free time, all right? Applying them during drills. If you're doing a skating drill and you know you've been working on your inside and outside edge, you should be thinking about that when you're doing your crossover drills. You should be thinking about that when you're doing your flow drills at practice, because that's when you can apply them. Tell your coach if there's a problem, why are you doing that? Why learn this? And I'm trying to do that. Communicate. Other, other things you can do. So it's, again, notebook, putting it in practice. Off-ice. We said this. There's never been as many off-ice training aids. And, and here's the thing. You don't even need them. I'm not going to lie to you. I own a training aid company. Mike does the same stuff. I want you to get the stuff that we provide. But the truth is people have been doing off-ice training forever. All right? If you need to work on your backhand, all you need is a dad or a mom to make a backhand pass to you. And you can catch it. Right? You need to work on your shooting. Get a net. Get a shooter tutor. Get something out there, take 100 shots a day. I took 500 shots every single day after school. People thought it was crazy. I did that every day. And I'll tell you what, I got pretty darn accurate. Why did I do that? Because they used to call me stone hands. I couldn't score when I I could not score. In fact, I, I think I became a playmaker, Mike, because I got really good at passing because I couldn't shoot. But one summer I decided I'm going to get good at this. 500 shots a day, I got pretty accurate at shooting, right? So, so you got to know where your gaps are in your game. Find the right clinic, find the right coach that's going to teach you that. And then it's not going to get fixed in three days. I always say this about team building. I can get any group together, any group. You could all hate each other. I can get any group to work together for a day. It's not hard at all. All right. It's not hard. Getting them to work together for six months, a year, five years, that's really hard. And it does not happen overnight. You need repetitive communication. You need repetitive drills, communication. You need to work on things over and over again. I can tell you this right now. I'm working with a group right now. Communication is the primary problem they have. And it breaks down every three months like that. And we have to do the same things and they're getting better at it, but it, yeah. th they know the drill, but they're not applying it enough. Last one. I'll tell you hockey team I'm working with right now has a problem scoring in front of the net, right? They, well, what do we do? What do we do? Coaches listen up players. Listen up. 
Well, what are you doing in practice? What are you doing in your drills and practice? Are you shooting and turning away from the net? Guess what? They were. So I talked to the coach of the team. I talked to the goalies too. All right. Cause I, I make sure the goalies know when I'm going to do this. Cause it's really wrong. If you don't, I said, every single shot that's taken at practice, if there is, if there's a rebound, you will go for it. Goalies. I tell them you do not have to try and save it. If it does not correspond to the drill the right way, obviously if it's a scrimmage, yes, you need to try and save it. But if it's a flow drill, you don't need to go try and save the rebound. Okay. Unless you want to players, if there's, you do not turn away from the net. The shot is not over till it's in the net or completely out of play. You do that. How many times in a practice, Mike, you're probably getting 20 shots of practice, hopefully more. How many shots you get in a game? Zero to five max. Every practice, you go to the net, you get your rebound, you put it in the net. Guess what? You're going to get good at rebounds. Last, last one, I promise, Mike, you're, 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 this pet peeves of mine, right? Oh, no. He's in front of the net. Well, okay. Yeah. In front of the net, in front of the net, there's typically one play. It's probably shoot. Okay. Right in front of the net. Yeah. There's other plays at times, right? You get good at that by practicing shooting in front of the net. There's not a magical button you press in your brain that in the game, the puck shows up in front of the net, you score. The guys that score in front of the net practice scoring in front of the net over and over and over again. Tip, down, turn, shot, get the puck, shoot, lift it, pass, lift it, pass. You can see them doing these drills, right? It doesn't just happen in a game. Yeah. Go ahead, Mike. No, I mean, I, I was at a presentation of Dave Smith's uh, head coach at RPI, and he used to do this presentation on uh, when he was growing up, he, all his coaches would do a loop and shoot drills. He said, I was the best loop and shooter probably on the team. I could loop, shoot, and get in the line faster than anybody on the team, right. but didn't right. score many goals that way. And no. I think even to your point, like shooting and following your puck is a skill. It's a learned it's a behavior. big skill. And, you know, and I, and I do that yeah. with my private lessons. Like my players can't loop. If, when they shoot and score, they have to actually go in the net and get their puck out. But it's a, the obligation of the coach to also say, when if there is a, you have to create your drills so that there's re, there's there's ways for goalies to finish the play. Like a, a goalie should always be able to track a puck absolutely to, the, to its end. So that's a that's a nuance of you know a seasoned coach to a coach who doesn't care about his goalies. Like I used to joke all the time, like I, I really don't care about my goalies because I have three of them. <laughs> and, you know, the, somebody's going to learn. Right. So I think, you know, one of them is going to learn how to play. But I think I think it's just that's the obligation of the coach. I think on the other side of this, too, is so I'm I'm paid as a skills coach to be a good skills coach. How do you become a better skills coach? Well, you make sure your kids actually develop skills. Right. So if you have a if you have a private coach that's not following up or or, you know, you know giving you homework or giving you ways to um, definitively know if you're getting better, then, then again, I don't think that's a, I don't think that's a coach you want to pay, or I don't think that's a, I wouldn't consider that a coach that is in your best interest. I, I, they could churn you out. And, you know, if your coach is out there with his hot chocolate and putting you through the same drill every week and saying, Hey, good job, Johnny, you're doing great, doing great. Everybody should love you. You're doing great. Right. Just, you don't need, don't give a check to that person. Say, Hey, thanks. Thanks for your time today but I need somebody that's going to invest in my kid. Right. And, yeah. and, and that doesn't take, that doesn't take, um, takes you know, time. First, it takes time. And, and, and I'm telling you, yeah. I'd pay an extra 10 bucks for that extra 10 minutes. I really would. I mean, you know, right. give me, right. give me the time to say, here's my homework because here's the thing, right? If you're, if you're a really good skills coach and you really have the best interest of the kid and you, and you find like, like me, like I interview the kids that I coach. I don't want I don't want a, co a kid that's being, that comes to my office or comes to me and can't explain to me what they want to do. If dad and mom are telling me what they're going to do, I'm like, I'm just not the right guy for you because right, right. your son has to be the one that I trust is going to make me look good. Like I'll give you a perfect example. This summer I worked with a player and the biggest problem was the, the all the brush offs gets the puck, makes a move brush. Br when I say brush off to parents at home, it means you just continue to stick handle before you shoot. And as you move up the levels of the game, there is no time to yeah. do anything else but catch and shoot. Nothing. Or catch and pass. It has to be one motion. It's one surrounding the puck motion. Right. So right. in my practices, we just stop it. Brushing, brushing off. No, no, no. Doesn't count. I scored. No, no, no. Doesn't count. Let's go back. So I watched this player. I'm on Instat watching, you know, the last nine goals. And eight of them were catching and shooting. Catch, shoot. Catch, shoot. 
catch you. Goal, 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 goal. And that's from last year to this year, that's muscle memory. That's something in their brain that said, I'm not even thinking, to your point, I'm not thinking about not brushing the puck off. I'm catching and shooting it because that's the memory and the muscle that is going to give me the most success. And I think that's where, you know, when, when we talk about building on skill and building long-term, and if you're going to get a private coach and you're going to go to a clinic, find ways to get that clinic to give you long-term involvement, not short-term satisfaction. You get the right. satisfaction in the one day. My son loved it. He look at, you know, Daryl Belfry talks about this all the time, right? There's a big difference between sweating and looking busy and learning. Right. Right. I, anybody, I, listen, I can line the kids up and give them a good sweat, but did they learn? Did they retain? And, and, and real skill developers, sometimes it doesn't look good. It doesn't right. look like they're working. Like you look at Tim Turk doing, you know, shooting can, uh, clinics. He doesn't look like he's working very hard. It's like well, all the kids are doing is, is they're just changing their hips and their feet. And he's just grabbing them by their arms and telling them where to move. They're really not working very hard. <laughs> well, yeah, but they're learning. So they right. don't need to work hard. Like, right. so, and I think that's, that's the point is, is it, you know, if you're looking for conditioning, you know, conditioning is one thing and the same thing with conditioning, right? If you're going to do a conditioning camp for a weekend and then stand in lines for the next 25 weeks, well, I don't know what the point of that is either. Yeah. I'll, I'll give you a great drill. We did this year uh, with, and you can actually do this at any age group. I did this with eight year olds. You could do this with 18 year olds um, uh, in different ways. You know, it's, it's over speed training or overdoing it training. So I noticed that my kids were a little shy on their um, crossovers. Right? They were shy. And what I mean is they weren't fully doing it. Most of them were afraid to fall down. Uh, again, first of all, I always tell young kids, it's okay to fall down. It's the whole point. You're going to fall down as an adult. It doesn't matter. Right. So what I did is, okay, kids, and I, I demonstrated first, I want you to do the biggest, most ridiculous crossovers you've ever done in your life around the circle. And I went first, and it's gigantic steps, look like the Ministry of Funny Walks, I mean, Money Python fans out there, just gigantic. And I'm telling, look how big my legs are getting. This is what I want you to do. It's okay if you fall down, right? And then they all did it, right? And it became so silly and fun that they were doing it. And it looked ridiculous. It looked like I was playing a joke if you're a parent, right? We did that two times. Then I said, okay, let's do normal crossovers. Guess what, Mike? Perfect, <laughs> right? They I know, I, I, listen, I do, right. I do exaggerated yeah. hockey moves with right. my kids even now. And they think like my older guys, especially like my 18, 19 year olds, they're always looking around, like looking to see if anybody was in the rink. Cause they're right. like, this is, this right. is ridiculous. Yeah, but like, teaching. This, does, this doesn't make sense. I go, yeah, but we're, 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 we're making you, we're making you focus on this individual right. piece of the skill. Like it's one piece that you need to fix. You're right. a strong kid. You're having your, you know, protein shakes. You're going to the weight room. You're doing all the things you need to do, but there's one little, I call it like a hitch. Like you're just not finding that little piece and we're going to exaggerate it so far out that it's going to feel ridiculous, right. but you're going to know you're doing it. And then we're going to bring it in. Then we're going to slowly right. but surely it works. bring it back in. It's, and it's the it's, weighted bat phenomenon, but, right? Why but, do but baseball players use weighted bats? Right. And this is the conversation I had all weekend though, that that's great and dandy, but if you can't maintain that same posture for 25 more weeks, right? because we don't have time in our hockey worlds anymore. You don't have the time to, to practice three days a week in, a, in flow drills, do two or three games on the weekend, and then find time for skill development. And that's sad, actually, but it's just the truth. And I think we need to, well, you know, here's you the deal. Need to find ways to find time. It's going back to the beginning of the episode. The accountability is on you as the, as the player and the parent if you can do it together because you both want to do it, that's the best case scenario, right? Yeah. To, to make time to work on those skills. Again, I shot in my garage every day. I found lots of different creative ways to work on my game in my own time, right? And that's like most things in life. If you have a love for something, you're going to put in the time. But practices is the coach's time and the team's time. Games, games are the team's time, right? You got to find the time to do that. Other thing, one more last thing as a coach, um, and this is my advice to other coaches and Mike, I, you know, I'd love for you to chime in on this too. I've seen a lot of coaches make the mistake of, oh, I got 55 things I got to work on this season. Whoa. <laughs> Whoa. Okay. You got to slow down. And I, I've said it before. I've seen coaches give 
35, 40 commands a game to kids. You're crazy. You're crazy. Kids can't take more than two. I was asked one time, well, what would you do? What are the two things? One offensive thing, one defensive thing just to work on because it's development, right? So, so when you're coming to practice coaches or games for that matter, it's okay to bring those fit. We all got things to work on, right? But if you're talking about power play passing before you can pass, right? You got to bring it down to the basic levels. Okay. These are the two to five things I want to accomplish maybe in the next month. That's a, a healthy, appropriate goal for a coach, right? And then those skills can lead to other skills. And here's the thing. Again, Mike, I want you to chime in this too. Let's say you get to the end of the month. You're not where you want to be. Do it for another month or find another way to do it. You got you to gotta be patient with the development. You got to find the fundamentals. I loved this year. I'm going to say this to you again. I loved this year specifically knowing we needed to work on something like a breakout. And then, and this is me though, breaking it down to what are the fundamental skills they need on a breakout. Again, that might sound basic to a lot of younger coaches. I've never had to do that before. Every level I've coached at, they've known the basic skills. I really like deconstructing, talking to other coaches. What should I teach first? How will they learn this? What drills can we do to teach catching on a backhand and then moving forward with speed? And then you realize you got to bring that even further back. I enjoyed that process, but it all starts with, okay, for the next three to four weeks, and it can be more, it can be less, two to three specific things from a team level that we're going to work on. And if you need to break it down more, okay, little Johnny has a hard time stopping on his left foot. We're going to give him some specific time or give him a coach for 10 minutes of practice. We'll work on that. That's how you start to run a, a really good team type situation. But if you're doing, okay, this week we're working on this, next week we're working on that, this week we're working on this. If you're working on 15 different skills a month, you're, you're crazy. You're crazy. Find the three fundamental things you need to work on and, and, and get great at those before you move on. Mike. Yeah, and, that, and that's why the structure of, of, of team station-based practices is so brilliant and right. such a great addition to our sport because you can group kids with the same tendencies and the same um, liabilities right. into their group. So if you have, you know, it doesn't have to be the fours and the D. It could be, okay, these are all the kids that are really having trouble with crossovers. When I have them in my small group of five kids, I can really focus on these kids because they have a similar – Right. It's, in, in school, we do it all the time. All you the don't time. put kids at, at nine different reading levels in the same reading class. Right. You, you have to extract the kids and put them in different reading classes because they, they, right. the kids that are advanced aren't learning anything because they're bored. And the kids that are not able to do it are not learning anything because they don't right. even know how to understand what the hell you're well, doing. And this, you're is the coach that has lost, all the kids. this is where parents get lost. Because I want my kid to have the same opportunities as the kids who can read really well. Okay. Your kid needs to learn the basic fundamentals of reading before he needs to learn the alphabet before all, he can read. All like year, that. all I, all year, I heard <laughs> we've got to play AAA teams if we want to be a AAA team. I go, yeah, but you can't play a AAA team if you don't get to touch the puck. You don't get better. Did you, did you listen like, to my last episode? Yeah, I, I, I mean, had a B team beat an A team because we didn't do that all year, right? We, I'm like, I'm like, so, up. so how, yeah. to, to play the to be the best to play the best is fine and dandy, but you actually right. have to touch the puck. Right. Like you actually have to participate in the advancement of the player. So, you know, and again, if you're, if you're a coach of a six year old and you're lying the kids up, I, I saw it this weekend, I was laughing my ass off. So if you, if you put the kids out in front of you on the bench and you take the whiteboard out with six year olds and you drop a play, what, which is great, I guess, watch the kids when the whistle blows and they go out. And I guarantee you, yeah. if you had like, if you had like the, uh, the NBC tracker, you know, where they have the, the kids, the, the, the they, they show the guy's <laughs> right, name. Right. That if you showed the board and then showed the tracker, yeah, the kids would all go to different places anyway. Right. They wouldn't even go to the right place. I'm like, right. didn't you just just hear what I said? Because like I don't even know. No, what the they're hell not you're even looking about. at you. Like, like, what, I, like, here's hey, a you fundamental left, skill. When you go to the left faceoff circle, make sure you're going here. And the kids like, which is my left again? Right, is it right. This? So, so left? Mike, it's a great point with this Mike team this year. Like, you want to talk about breaking it down? Um, I remember I was explaining a drill to them one time and I realized none of them were looking at me. They're just, you know, it's, it's, it's the switch, right? And adults talking, it's let me look someplace else. So I, I had the wherewithal. I'm thankful for this. I got frustrated at first. Then I was like, Oh, we need to work on listening. We just need to work on that. So at team building in the afternoons, we would do listening exercises where you had to kind of pay attention. I had to build their listening. And here's the, any teacher of a second grader would have told me that 
right? They would have said right. that you, you need to listen. So like the fundamental skill wasn't even the hockey. It was like, we need to get better at listening. And I told them, here's the thing, Mike, I told them, hey, we're not great at listening. You guys are all eight years old and that's completely normal. So we're going to work on that. And ask, they your did. First, ask your first grade teacher if they put up three things on the board, on the, on the smart board. <laughs> right. Okay, do this, do this, and do this. Yeah. Come, come back in 15 minutes and tell me if you're done. Yeah, that's ask not me if anybody does. You know who does it? It's just like hockey. The two kids in the class do it. That's right. The yeah, and they're the standouts. Pets. Right. The hell with them. They're good. <laughs> yes, they're advanced. I get it. They're, 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 I understand. But the rest right. of them are, are, are like, are we supposed to go to the Lego table? You're that like, guy with the bumper sticker that says, my kid beat the crap out of your honor roll student. Right, and that's it. great. And again, I love that. I, I just had a big thing this weekend. I'm like, yes, they're, I get it. They're a, they're a great, great, great advanced right. children. 100%. But there are many more that just need you to be age appropriate. And, that's and you school. shouldn't be comparing your kid to that kid. Right. So one of the things I wanted yeah. to bring up, too, in this whole idea about retention and, and development and clinics versus the season, too, is one of the strategies that I found with a lot of my players that really helps them is find uh, we call it. Well, I call it an accountability buddy, like somebody else on your team that wants to work with you. Right. And it, 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 it's not just you alone. And I think what happens is like, this, this is the best part about, you know, being a hockey director and being in the world of sports, I guess, is the one dad that's always like, Oh no, no, we don't, we don't really do the extra work. And then you go to like the power skating clinic on Saturday yeah. and he's there, he's there. yeah, and, with his kid. And he didn't tell anyone else. Cause he's like, right. Oh no, I want to leg up. I, I'm like, well, it doesn't make said, any you, sense. Like, yeah. are you insane? But they are insane. And I get it. So they, just the, the <laughs> accountability. And again, I, I don't begrudge them. I just, I, I no, just, they, they I don't, don't listen to this show anyway, right? No, they don't. And I think, yeah. and again, if I, and I, I actually used this example this weekend, the same thing. I'm unfortunately inundated with really great, uh, you know, child development, player development pro coaches in my daily life. Like right. every right. day I talk to a pro coach, a pro skills instructor, an Olympic coach, women's national coaches every day right so my perspective is so skewed right because i'm like why doesn't everybody see this and i think it'd be the same way like i'm not a stockbroker but if you sat me right. in a room of stockbrokers right. they'd be like this guy's an idiot he's <laughs> listen he's li he just read the new york times and he thinks he can or the wall street journal and he thinks he can tell me how to run you know do stocks i can't but right. I know my limitations. And I think that's the same thing. Like when I'm speaking with hockey parents, I really try to be conscious of the fact that unfortunately, or fortunately, all this, all this information is, is given to me that I can now decipher and say, right. I don't know, 28 people thought this. And the guy who paved my driveway thought this. So who do I want to listen to? Right. The guy who doesn't know anything about what he's talking about. Now, if these 28 people told me, to pave my driveway in January 16th after a snowstorm, I'd probably be like, well, I'm going to listen to the guy who paves driveways every single day of his life. That's right. who I'm listening to. So right. it, it's the same thing with skill developers. And, and, and I, I, and frankly, that's why I, I love this podcast because we, we're almost, we're taking, we're giving hopefully people, you know, clearing out all the gray and saying, well, listen, why don't you just, why don't you just do the right thing the first time? and find right. your path easier now again and everybody's gonna have different <clears throat> ways to do it but i think with the skill development aspect of this most parents would just assume i don't know i went to, I, I paid a lot of money for the power skating clinic on last weekend my kid should actually be a, right probably a perfect skater now shouldn't he <laughs> and and it, yeah but I get it. I, 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 hundred percent get well, it. I really this do. This is where networking comes in too. You know, it's never been easier to go out there and ask and, 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 and find things and call people and you know, what worked for you. It, this competitive atmosphere is stupid to me in youth hockey. It is really dumb, right? You should be working together to figure out what the best place is for all the kids, not just your kid. Um, in the sense of asking around, if your kid needs to work on skating, ask, well, what's a great skating clinic? Right. It's not hard to find. It's just not hard to find to find today, Mike. And, and like I said, with resources like you, right, the network we're creating, the Facebook group that we have, our kids play hockey, ask, <laughs> ask, you got qualified people. And I always tell people too, if, if I'm, if I'm, if you think I'm wrong, if you really do, 
then debate me because I want because I want knowledge. Right. If, if, if you're going to tell me that what I'm saying is there's no ego there. BS. You say, yeah. I'm like, that's great. I said, I didn't even yeah. think about that. Like, like right. uh, you're saying to me that really the reality is not what I think you're telling you're giving me real information. And I'm going to be able to extract that and use it. I think that's unbelievable. You know, Give yeah. me that. It, it, like I said, and this is again, big advice. You have to try and remove ego from all these situations. There's so much ego around. I see it. But, you know, I remember one time somebody uh, proved me wrong on something. And I said, okay, you're right. And they kept coming like, well, no, you were wrong. I said, yeah, no, I was wrong. You were right. They, they could not accept that. I was just like, oh, yeah, no, when you prove me wrong, you've, you've done it. And I've learned and I appreciate, I actually appreciate it. Um, you gotta take the ego out of it, but look, that's actually all the time we have. If we can yeah. keep going on here, this was an awesome conversation. It was awesome, awesome episodes. And we hope you, you got some takeaways here from the two coaches talking, uh, definitely about ways to retain and, and the understanding that there is no quick fix that is sustainable. If you don't put the time in, right. Someone can give you the knowledge, but you got to apply the knowledge. This is like anything. This is a life conversation. We're not talking about just hockey right now. Right. How'd you the learn right to walk too? How'd right you learn time. to walk? You practice. How'd you learn the alphabet? You practiced for a year. How'd you learn to read? You practiced for 15 years, right? You don't just show someone the alphabet and what a word is and they figure it out. It doesn't work that way. It's not going to work that way in hockey either, right? And the more you learn, the more you apply, the more you learn how to think. That's another one. Teach your kids how to think. The quicker they're going to retain information. And above all, do not Get lost in comparing your kid with another kid of a different skill level at the same age. We all develop in different times in different ways. I started hockey again when I was 12. Right? I developed very, very quick. I was very blessed. I was missing all the skill sets at 12. All right. We all develop in our own way. Support your kids. Love your kids. Coaches, talk to other coaches, please. Private coaches and coaches, please talk to each other. It will behoove the child who is actually the one in, in, in charge here, if you think about it. All right. That's going to do it for this episode of Our Kids Play Hockey. Uh, Mike Benelli, great conversation today. Appreciate it. We'll be back with uh, Christy Cacciano Burns next week. We missed you, Christy. I hope you listened to this. We missed you. And uh, remember, you can get all the episodes on ourkidsplayhockey.com or wherever podcasts can be heard. If you have an episode uh, subject you want us to talk about, email us. Contact us on the Facebook page, Our Kids Play Hockey, or email us at team at ourkidsplayhockey.com. We're always looking for great episode ideas. We want to answer your questions, so check it out. All right, that's going to do it. Thanks so much. You guys have a wonderful, 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 wonderful week, day, month, year. And we'll see you next time on Our Kids Play Hockey. We hope you enjoyed this edition of Our Kids Play Hockey. Make sure to like and subscribe right now if you found value wherever you're listening, whether it's a podcast network, a social media network, or our website, ourkidsplayhockey.com. Also, make sure to check out our children's book, When Hockey Stops, at whenhockeystops.com. It's a book that helps children deal with adversity in the game and in life. We're very proud of it. But thanks so much for listening to this edition of Our Kids Play Hockey, and we'll see you on the next episode.